Okay. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, uh, and thank you for inviting me to talk about what we do up here in the Loon Valley. Um, for those of you who geography isn't brilliant, um, the Loon Valley is up in the northwest of England, just off Morecambe Bay, uh, and it starts off <clears throat> in Morecambe Bay and runs into the, uh, the Pennines. Here's some views of the valley itself. On the top left hand corner, you can see where the loon enters the, uh, the sea. And we have vast areas, I mean vast areas of coastal marsh. Um, <clears throat> these flood, uh, but they produce a completely different environment, uh, both temperature and um, forage wise uh, for the rest of the valley. We then have what we term the middle section of the valley, which is a typical river, um, wooded on one side, pasture on the other. But as it goes inland, um, about 30 miles, it eventually ends up uh, our patch on the second highest peak in the Pennines at just short of 1,800 feet. So our area goes from sea level to about 1,800 feet, which produces three quite distinct uh, areas of forage. Um, <clears throat> We've got the lowland plains, the grass plains uh, of the salt marshes. Then we have the meadows and the woods. Then we have the high moorland pasture uh, <clears throat> at the eastern end of the valley. The valley itself is just short of 30, the lower valley is just, just short of about 30 miles. Uh, our group, uh, although I've been keeping bees since uh, the year 2000, our group was set up in uh, 2016 by a group of us who really wish to move away from conventional beekeeping methods uh, and practice more bee-friendly, uh, less interventionist uh, ways of keeping bees. Um, this didn't go down too well with the existing local groups, uh, so we felt more practical to uh, form a new group. Uh, we are technically a, a CIO, and we have around 50 members. Almost all of them are much more interested in bees in the environment than in producing honey. Uh, in fact, most of us regard honey as quite a hindrance to beekeeping. But our main concerns uh, around conventional beekeeping were um, the degree of intervention into the life of a colony. If you did that with wild animals, you'd get locked up under the, uh, <coughs> the Nature Act. The frequent usage of chemicals was also a concern. We did have a number of older members or smaller members who found the amount of heavy lifting was such that they were uh, about to give up beekeeping. Conventional beekeeping didn't really seem to be part of the environment. And then there was the amount of time it takes. Our other thing was we have a couple of disabled members and the lifting of normal hives doesn't make the beekeeping accessible are readily accessible for disabled people, particularly those in wheelchairs. We were very strongly influenced by this character who I'm sure you've all heard of if you haven't met. Uh, I do correspond with him fairly regularly. Um, <clears throat> and he, as I say, shares our views. That's very conceited. We share his views um, about conventional beekeeping. We eventually, when we were looking at this, came up with a bit of a spectrum on one hand, we've got the conventional beekeeping, which is quite an intensive managed, mainly focused on the needs of the beekeeper rather than the bees. On the other hand, uh, and I went on a few natural beekeeping courses, uh, which varied enormously. One I went on, I won't name them, but uh, uh, it was the, the High Priestess of the Apiary of Avalon, which you may have heard of. Um, they run some very expensive courses, but uh, it really did nothing to infuse me for beekeeping. So I was looking really for a middle path. Um, how can we manage our bees responsibly, but with the min minimum of intervention? Now, of course, the first thing we come up with in conventional beekeeping is, is inspections and the amount of inspections. And it concerned me that Inside the temperature, and there's more and more research on this, the bees maintain temperature and humidity, but an ever increasingly complex cocktail of pheromones. I think at the last count, there was 28 different ones identified, and there could be many more. And this whole environment is lost every time you open the hive up. 
uh, and it takes the bees quite a while to, uh, to restore it. So that didn't strike me as a particularly um, clever thing to do. Then, of course, we've got the thorny question of swarming. Most inspections are carried out weekly during the swarming season to prevent it. Um, we took the view that as swarming is a fairly natural process and the bees leave a lot of the varroa behind, perhaps we should adopt a different way. And that's to allow the bees to swarm into pre-sighted swarm boxes, which we do in fact do. We have them scattered all over the place, uh, up trees, and they proved very successful for us. Uh, I will take the point straight away that we live in a rural area rather than urban, but even in the city, the centre of Lancaster itself, which is a, a city, we do have swarm boxes and the public have been very supportive of them uh, and tell us about them. And so at Club A3, we have them scattered literally all over the place on poles, but the big advantage is we don't have to inspect the colonies and ruin their environments. The bee swarm, we catch more swarms than we have colonies, so we must be doing something right. And of course, because these are, in fact, nuke boxes, they've got frames in, so we can leave the bees there for quite a few weeks before we have to move them. And then it's just a question of moving frames from one box into another. The next area was in this use of chemicals. Uh, I'm not a chemist, but it does strike me that if you've got to put protective clothing on when you put in some of the treatments like formic acid, um, if you have to be protected, then it can't do the bees any good. And I never, I've never understood the argument that what will not kill a bee, but will kill a mite uh, is safe. But when you start looking into the research that's gone on, um, notably not very little in the UK, but Sweden, Italy, France, USA, Norway, the EU, they're all coming to the conclusion that if you leave bees untreated, they eventually establish uh, a stabilizing situation. Now, I haven't treated my bees for the last 14 years. My colony losses are minuscule. Most of our members do exactly the same. And again, if you look at the DEFRA literature, we were told back in the late 1990s when I've gone to read it, that if we didn't treat our bees, there'd be no feral colonies left. Well, that's not the case where we are. The number of feral colonies is increasing steadily. Uh, and most of us don't treat our bees in the area. Uh, so I have reservations to say about treating, uh, and we don't tend to treat our bees uh, at all. The next thing we looked at was foundation. And again, you find, and there's different research on this as well, that shows a lot of the available wax contains contaminants, which don't do the bees any good. So we took the view, we won't use foundation, we'll let the bees draw out their own comb. And what was interesting, and we have no reason for this, is we've identified quite clearly that the bees are drawing out at least five different sizes of cell. As I say, we haven't yet worked out how they, why they're doing that. And we do have two researchers looking into it, but say so this is just open comb. As a matter of interest, the, um, and I'll come back to it later, the slide on the right, which has a, a frame inside a frame, the, fra the smaller frames are 14 B12, and the outer frame is an 18 inch half meter square frame, uh, which we use in our Russian hives. But I'll show you more of that in a moment. But another big point was the use of insulated hives. Now, if you look at a tree with a bee's nest in it, and the two on the left are examples, you'll see there's at least four or five, sometimes six inches of insulation. Whereas on a standard Western Red Cedar uh, brood box, commercially manufactured, the wall is only about half an inch thick. So it loses an awful lot of heat. And again, research, you'll know this name coming up, Derek Mitchell, it shows that the bees in these uninsulated hives 
need to use up an awful lot of stores and energy just keeping the hive warm because of the heat that leaks out, particularly through the roof. So that's our views. That's our philosophy, if you like. What do we do in practice? Well, in July 2016, we acquired our first Club Apiary, a 2.9 acre site. It needed, well, it had an advantage that it had a car park. Actually, that's an old tennis court, but it does as a car park. And we had a, a heated greenhouse, summer house in there, and a toilet, which is a big advantage. But it needed a bit of work doing on it. And we started learning some new beekeeping skills, like how to use a chainsaw, how to use a digger, which was all great fun. Um, toys for the boys, as the lady said, but we did enjoy it. But the slide on the top left gives you some idea of the site. It had been used as a dumping ground by the home, which is about 100 years old. And in fact, in the end, we actually got the local archaeological society to come in and they fished out all sorts of things like Victorian brass bedsteads and uh, old medical instruments and everything else. But it did need a bit of tidying up. Um, and it took a bit of work, but nevertheless, we did enjoy it. In September 16, we got our first newsletter, which is now 12 pages at least and runs as run every month. And we laid the foundation for our first training apiary. Again, we are very keen to allow disabled access, so we do need all weather uh, access to it. So that meant a concrete base. Um, we're not keen on concrete, but it's the best thing to do. And then we had a variety of hives uh, in there, and I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. We introduced seven colonies of bees, which we've maintained there ever since. And this is where we use uh, <coughs> we use for training. As I mentioned earlier, we are very keen to see beekeeping as part of the environment. So we decided we would produce our own wildflower meadow. It's um, 900 square meters. And we also got given 1400 whips of native shrubs and trees, uh, which we planted up. We got a container for uh, producing, for storing our kit. Uh, again, that was donated. We started to run training courses, uh, both theory uh, and practical. And we get about a dozen people um, a year in our courses, which is just a comfortable number for us to manage. And then in 2018, our wildflower meadow actually bloomed for the first time, uh, which was fabulous, but we then had to learn another beekeeping skill, that's how to scythe. Uh, and we did, in fact, in the end, start to bring scything courses because we found a local expert, um, <coughs> which uh, was quite interesting. What I did learn was scything, in scything, you can hurt everybody but yourself. So you need to be careful. We have first open day, and this proved successful, and we've had one ever since, and it raises some useful funds for us. We've been getting invitations to speak to other organizations of a wide diversity. Uh, Rota Kids is a, a conference that uh, the Rotary runs for uh, school kids once a year and it focuses on the environment. And then within the grounds of uh, Nazareth House where we are, there's a children's nursery and they're quite fascinated by bees. Uh, so this is me talking them through a, an observation hive, but most days when it's fine, they actually come and have a walk through the apiary uh, as part of their exercise. Um, our membership continued to grow and we suddenly started finding through the internet and exchange of newsletters that there were a lot of similar minded bee clubs uh, in Northern Europe who were interested in talking uh, to us. I must admit, their 
style of beekeeping has now gone to this tree beekeeping, Ziegler in German, I understand, um, which we haven't got, got around to yet, basically because we haven't got any trees large enough. Um, but it's quite exciting if you like playing with chainsaws up trees. But we are a community organization and one of the things we did uh, in 2020 was we played host to um, a team of young people. These were people who were, for whatever reason were subject to court orders because of behavioral problems. But uh, we actually got them working in our woodlands. It takes about an acre, maybe or half a woodland. And we got them making paths and logging through, well, not chopping them down, but uh, certainly shredding them. And uh, that worked quite well. And now we have a plethora of hedgehog houses and uh, bug hotels and all sorts of things scattered through the woodland. But one of the things that's really took us a bit by surprise um, is most of the lands, agricultural land in our area, produces grass. It's not regarded as particularly uh, productive land, but it does produce grass, uh, mainly to sustain sheep with a little bit of beef and, and some dairy. But the farmers cut this grass three, four, five times a year to make silage. So there's virtually no forage comes from the grass. At the same time, these organizations that you see the logos on the top, um, on the back of climate change interest, started promoting commercial, uh, sorry, charitable uh, cooperatives to grow local uh, produce. And in fact, they've even got a, a local uh, recipe book, what you can cook from what you can grow locally. But they'd forgotten all about pollinators. So we were eventually involved in that to explain the role of pollinators and to show them how to keep bees um, in a less intensive way. So they can in fact contribute to the pollination um, without them becoming fanatical beekeepers. And we find that allotment associations are springing up just about everywhere. And the local authority has mapped out the whole of its area um, and is putting something like, I think they said 30 acres, not in one patch, uh, but 30 acres in total of land up for uh, agricultural use or horticulture mainly for those that want it. And most of these will eventually uh, have a beehive or two within pollination distance uh, of them. And again, that's an area that we didn't really uh, anticipate coming along. But again, as part of the community, we've been asked to get involved uh, and we are. Our latest project, uh, particularly with um, the ban on imp importation of bees and the desire to maintain our local strain and not have people import bees into our area, we've set up a breeding apiary. Um, just in its first year, again, we've got all weather access, which we regard as important. Uh, and next year, or this year rather, 2022, we hope to start producing uh, some bees for our newer members. Uh, we've got five nukes of fairly pure mellifera mellifera, and we have the sixth in the spring. Our initial intention is to concentrate on producing splits, uh, just to get our newly existing members up to the, the levels <coughs> of bees that they want. Uh, but we may get more ambitious as we gain experience. <coughs> this is not an area we've been down before. Again, we've been passionate about improving the environment. And our objective, or one of our objectives, is to create what we call Loon Valley Pollinator Corridor. We're told that to be effective, a corridor needs a patch um, at least every 300 meters, which is quite an ambitious target. But this was our very first attempt at a small patch, how to convert it into a forage patch. Uh, we took the grass on in March, we got it cleared out, we sowed it uh, in April, and by the time we got to the middle of June, it had a lot of flowers. Of course, Balloon Valley, as I said, is about 30 miles long. We want to pollinate a patch 
but every 300 meters. We can't do this on our own. So it's very important to get the community involved. And lo and behold, they came forth in their droves. Uh, this is a group of scouts. Um, the local authority took over a disused railway track and made a cycle track footpath out of it. And there was land on either side. So we're now busily creating a pollinator patch that run the whole length of that. Um, we found enormous support from parish councils who uh, again have odd patches of land, wasteland, and the whole thing is growing uh, quite enthusiastically. Here's some of the patches that we've got so far, and they've been taken over the last two or three years. But what we're finding is once we've got them established, providing we can cut the grass or get the grass cut in March time, and then again, August, September, they tend to largely itself seed, which has been quite useful and helpful. A couple of years ago, we were approached. Uh, Fred, we seem to have lost the sound. I don't, know, don't know why uh, why we've lost <clears> the sound. <throat> no, nothing there. We've got some hissing and buzzing in the background. No. <laughs> oh, you're coming back. Try again. Hello? Is that any yeah, better? That's it, you're on. Do you want me to go back a bit? Uh, it was just as you came to this slide, Fred. Okay. Um, about two and a half years ago, Bug Life decided that they wanted to create a pollinator corridor to run from Lancaster on the west coast across to Leeds, which is almost on the east coast. Uh, and that's a, a corridor of approaching 160 miles. It also goes over some of the highest ground in England. Uh, across the Pennines. Well, we are responsible for the first section of it from Lancaster up to Kirby Lonsdale, the Lower Loon Valley. So it's been quite quiet over the last couple of years with the COVID restrictions, but uh, we're hoping that uh, all these areas will be joined up very shortly. So we'll have this fantastic corridor going almost across the country, a bit like Hadrian's Wall. But from the very beginning, we were con concerned that conventional beehives didn't provide the bees with sufficient insulation. And the heavy lifting was deterring some people from keeping up beekeeping. And the fact that disabled people can't manage them. Now, this was an interest of mine long before we formed this group. And I started looking at alternative types of hive. Now, the innocuous looking hive in the top left hand corner, uh, you might recognize this beehive. My neighbors are convinced it's a Wendy house. It is, in fact, eight feet long. It has 40 frames, each half meter square, and it's a Russian Zamok. I was actually working in Russia some years ago when it came to the weekend. And they said, What are you going to do for a leisure activity? And I said, well, I'm, I thought I'd go to the pub and just blaze out. No, we don't permit that. You're here as a cultural guest. You will do a cultural activity. So I said, right, I'll go beekeeping. So they shipped me out to a village about two and a half hours drive southwest of Moscow, uh, where I met Fedor Lasutin, who wrote the book Beekeeping with a Smile, sadly no longer with us. But that's his uh, hive design. Um, I didn't... Uh, bring one back, I brought the plans back, and a friend of mine built it. Um, it's difficult to manage in that I've had to build a platform behind the hive so I can stand up high enough to lift a half meter square frame out. But it works, and uh, the walls on it are an inch thick timber to make a sandwich with four inches of cork in between. What we've found since is that's far more insulation that's actually necessary for our part of the world. The one in the middle, the gray looking thing, is basically the same design hive as Amok, 
but uh, I was at a building trade exhibition when a guy from Tarmac said to me, have you ever thought of building one out of an insulated block? I said, no, not in the month of Sundays. Well, he said, we have just got this super duper insulated block, which lets very little moisture through and virtually no heat. I'll give you a club some if you want to build a hive. So we did. Uh, this is the hive again. It takes 40 half meter square frames. The blocks are glued together, not cemented, but it does have a tremendous advantage in that it is deer proof. Uh, we've even had donkeys rub rubbing up against it without knocking it over. Um, it works well if you want a hive that you're not going to go into very often at all, but it's big. The one on the top right, the green one, is actually a zest hive designed by Bill Summers, who you probably have heard of. Uh, again, we built that out of blocks because we had some spare. The bees like it, but we find it quite difficult to manage, to be honest. And then the bottom left is uh, our first experiment with a long hive. And that, uh, again, takes two colonies. Uh, and that's got 40, 14 by 12 uh, frames in, which, again, it's still working in my garden. It's, it's worked very well indeed. But these were all sort of experiments to find something which we could work with as, uh, on an ongoing basis. And this is the box we came up with. Doesn't look terribly elegant, complete, uh, particularly when it's contrasted with the WCB, but it is a very functional hive. It takes 20 14 by 12 frames, which comfortably houses one colony of bees without the need for additional supers or brood boxes. So it takes frames. I'll come back to this, the floor. Uh, it's solid two thick inch wooden walls, um, which we've reached as a compromise between uh, providing sufficient insulation and uh, cost, particularly now when timber's gone through the roof. We did all sorts of experiments with things like Kingspan, what we found with Kingspan is the bees absolutely love to chew it. They don't seem to eat it, they just chew it. So unless you actually prevent them from getting at it, uh, it's a waste of time after a while. We hinge the roof so there's no need for heavy lifting there, and it can be managed by a person in a wheelchair. This is a schematic. I know it looks like a barbecue, but it does actually illustrate um, the parts of it. And again, our disabled member can manage it. They only have to lift one frame at a time, so it's quite convenient to handle from a mobility scooter. Now we come to the draw at the bottom. We used to call this a sump. We were told that wasn't posh enough. We have to call it an eco floor. Basically, it's a, a simple draw, which we have filled in this case with sterilized, uh, heat treated uh, wood chippings. Uh, we sterilize them for two reasons. One, it helps with the moisture and control in the hive, but secondly, it was sterile. Uh, and that was interesting from our experiment because we were interested in these creatures, uh, pseudoscorpions. They're actually types of spider. Uh, they are native to this country, but we know that they eat varroa. There has been claims that they groom bees to obtain the varroa, but we've got no evidence of that whatsoever. Varroa that drops off or they get out, they will eat. And the idea was if we could get populations of bees living in the bottom, uh, as happens in nature in a hollow tree, then that might be some benefit uh, to the bees. The second thing we looked at, um, again, after visiting the States where they're pursuing this very enthusiastically, is mycelium or, or fungus spores. Now you may have noticed your bees foraging on compost heaps, particularly moldy ones. Uh, my bees do that all the time. But the Americans have shown that certain types of mycelium um, helps, the bees get something from it, which helps them fight off viruses. Now you can in the States buy starter packs of this mycelium, 
you can't get it into the UK at the moment. And I did ask the customs if I could bring some in. And they sent me a hold in reply and another hold in reply. And I still haven't got a straightforward answer. But um, with our hives, our initial hives, particularly the ones at the, um, uh, in the Club Apiary, we do have a research program going on with Lancaster University. And they're doing two things. They're looking at the way populations of things build up in the ecofloors. They're trying to establish whether there's any symbiotic beneficial relationship. Uh, and we're also, where well, we can, um, starting to experiment with these mycelium. I think from memory, Nottingham University did some research on this some years ago, but uh, I never saw that come to a conclusion. We, of course, um, have all the problems that clubs do, particularly a small new club. We're having to find uh, funds, but we have received a fair amount of grants uh, over the years, up to 15,000, which have really helped our activities. So I hope that's given you a flavour of what we're all about. Thank you for listening. Take some questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Fred. Um, that's um, uh, there's some uh, interesting points there. I think um, other beekeepers can um, um, uh, can make use of. So, Richard, what have we got for questions? Uh, question: uh, First of all, uh, your swarm boxes that you have as your uh, your method of, of swarm control. Uh, is there a certain size that seems to be preferred by the bees or a certain location? As far as size goes, um, again, we found that uh, Sealy's were about one and a half cubic feet, uh, 40 litres. To be honest, a mace more six frame, um, uh, uh, probably nuke seems to work uh, best for us. What we have found in our club apiary, although it doesn't happen anywhere else, is we do have to coat them in a wooden box because the blinking squirrels eat holes in them. Uh, if we're going to keep them out all the time. The other things we found with them uh, are that to be effective, we need to put them up in the autumn so that they, they over weather. Uh, the bees don't seem to like the new ones or don't choose the new ones. Most of them are about six feet above the ground uh, the bees tend to like them higher up, but I've given up falling off ladders trying to get new boxes down out of trees. So we've compromised with the bees and they're about six foot up on the poles where we have them and thereabouts. We don't put anything in them other than six frames, including one of, drone, of drawn comb. And the drawn comb seems to be the thing that attracts the bees. We, we tried some with and some without, and the ones with the combing were populated first. Um, and the distance, we've got them scattered around the site. The nearest ones, I suppose, are about 50 feet away, and the furthest ones must be, I don't know, eight to 900 yards away. Excuse yeah. me, Fred, can you stop sharing your screen so the viewers yeah. can see you, please? Um, Hang on, that should have closed that down. Why hasn't it? Well, I'm trying. You are screen sharing. Stop screen sharing. There we are. Is that working? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> next question, um, is your, uh, your hive commercially available? Can people buy it? Yes, we, we do have them made locally for us and we do sell them, yes. Right. Uh, are we, what, we're, what we're just working out is the best way to actually transport them around because they're heavy. Uh, you can't just put them on uh, Hermes, they're too big. Yeah, and they would just be available through your Lund Valley website? That's right, they're on the website, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, have you lost any colonies? What kind of percentage loss are you looking at? And uh, they, are they're assuming that you don't feed? We don't feed once they're established. Um, this is a, a, an obvious a choice. But if we're setting up a, 
a, a package or a new, we would tend to feed it through the first year and then we don't feed again. The other thing that we do is we take our honey off if we are taking honey off in summer, we only tend to inspect three times a year, once in spring, once in the June gap, once in the autumn, and we would take the honey off in the June gap. Uh, last year was brilliant in that we had to take honey off in order to give the bees enough space to uh, expand. Uh, but our rationale is uh, if we don't take it off in the autumn, uh, the bees have collected that, that's their stores. Colonies that aren't strong enough to overwinter themselves anyway, we don't really want to keep weak colonies. We want them strong. We do know from the National Bee Unit every year it's quite almost predictable they will tell us that there are starving colonies uh, in our part of the world from conventional beekeepers mm. and uh, you can't prove it but it's almost certainly because people are taking off far too much honey uh, in the autumn i know that's a controversial view and i'll get some bricks thrown at me for that one but i'm pretty sure not not if i stand in front of you frank <laughs> I'll, I'll sort of agree with you on that one yeah the other thing we're finding as well, which exacerbates that problem, is because we're using insulated hives, the bees will often have some brood all through the winter, uh, and they will tend to use stores during the winter. So the more they can go into the winter with, the better they are. As far as losses are concerned, the only losses we had this year were from wasps. And the local uh, pest control officer looked at the council records and said they cleared out more wasps in the Lancaster area this year than they'd done in the previous 12 years. Not sure why, but uh, they were everywhere. Uh, we've had a question about um, uh, would, uh, how would imported mycelium affect local bi biodiversity? Um, I'm, well, mycelium uh, extracts are native to this country as well. So they're, they're native here. We haven't imported any. What we're actually trying to do is to get the university to extract local strains for us uh, and then see if we can grow them and spread them from there. And I'm really on this biodiversity one. I'm not importing anything. Uh, super. Can I, can, I, can I leave him, please? Because it touches on something you um, uh, you mentioned a, a question or two ago. Uh, if you've got a teaching apiary um, and you don't open your hives as much as anybody else, um, what is the uh, level of knowledge of your, your members compared to the, um, uh, bearing in mind, the short number of times that you han handle colonies? Well, I suppose technically uh, it may not be as great in that they don't have the vast amount of experience that you get if you go in uh, every week. But this is the way the people that we have want to keep their bees. Um, you know, the argument is the bees have looked after themselves for I don't know how many millions of years. Uh, do they really need us to go in every so often and perk around? Yeah. Okay. I know that's not everybody agrees with that, but um, um, oh, 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 I'm not making judgment. I'm just asking no, no. Uh, asking the questions because a lot of beekeeping is is observation, and you know what 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 you see. Yeah, well, you see, we would take another. We suggest one of the essential pieces of kit for a beekeeper is a deck chair, and people sit and watch their bees, and you can tell an awful lot uh, about how they behave as they enter the hive, as they fly around the hive. And from that point of view, I would think our people are probably much more observant of external behaviour right, yeah. uh, than they are the internal behaviour. Um, you, so you've mentioned uh, that you only inspect uh, usually around three times a year. Do you mm -hmm. make any preparations for spring increases and winter stores build up? Um, with established colonies, no. Um, <clears throat> obviously, with our breeding apiary, we're uh, are much more interventionist now. It happens to do all sorts of things that we don't advocate for a style of beekeeping. <clears throat> but no, we, um, the inspection is basically to look in and see that the bees are behaving as you'd expect them to, but let them get on with it. 
Uh, Kate wanted to know, as community beekeepers, does that mean that all colonies in the apiary belong to the organisation as a whole, or um, do the members look after their own colonies? Members look after their own colonies. The colonies in the club apiary belong to the club. Uh, are your swarm boxes in the same apiary as your hives? And if so, how do you get the bees re to reorientate when you move them uh, to the regular apiary from their homes in the trees? Um, yeah, frequently get asked that one. What we found, to be honest, is that if you lock the bees up for a day or two, and then when you remove them, if you cover the entrance with branches so that when the bees come out, they don't actually recognise where they are, we can move them relatively short distances. I mean, I've been using this technique for more than a decade. Uh, I do it in my garden if I want to move them from one side to the other, and we do it in the apiary. We haven't lost one yet doing that. It breaks their or orientation. They come out, they don't recognise where they are because they've got to fight their way through branches, uh, and they just seem to... So right here we are, we'll be oriented. Um, you mentioned that you, you started to uh, rear your own bees and, and queens. What uh, queen rearing method are you using? No, I deliberately say we didn't raise queens. We haven't got oh, around to that. Uh, we're starting off simply with splits. Um, <clears throat> sorry, we're starting with splitting colonies. We're also going to experiment with Mini uh, taking queen cells out and put them in mini boxes and see where we get with that one. But so we haven't actually started queen rearing per se yet. Uh, Fred, can I nip in, nip in then? Mm. Um, if you get a swarm coming in from outside, um, do you find that natural selection takes out the weakest ones in the, in, in the first winter? Yes, we are finding that our bees are growing darker all the time. Um, Ten years ago, there was quite a lot of, obviously, Italian extract bees in the area. There aren't many of those left now. Uh, the stronger hives certainly pull through, and the weaker... It's not. To, it's nowhere near as bad now as it was. And when we first started off down this approach, we were losing colonies during the winter. Um, but equally, you notice they were the ones with the least stores. Um, now, it's not an issue, really. The stronger ones are coming through. We've got a nice strain in the valley. Uh, almost all of us are on the same strain. Uh, we are improving it slightly with bringing in some darker uh, AMMs, purer ones, as we can get them. Uh, and they're gradually dissipating. So by and large, we, we're relatively happy with the strain that we've got, and we'd rather produce more from this strain and supply our new members rather than have them bring in uh, other bees. I mean, one of the experiences we did have was because we're surrounded by the high pennines, there's quite a lot of heather there, and the only time we've ever had fowl brood in the area was with beekeepers from outside the area bringing their bees into the heather. Now, most of the landowners um, won't allow it. Uh, Linda says her, uh, sends her thanks. She says uh, the first year she kept me, she put some fresh bagged bark. They would go mad in little heaps in certain parts of the chips, and you solved the mystery for her. Yeah, they're going for mycelium. I mean, there are 40,000 plus different strains of mycelium, so it's very difficult to get a particular one, but... Yeah, I, I see them on my compost heap doing precisely that. Uh, Julian asks if you ever tried the Warray hive. Yes. Uh, I, I have tried the Warray hives. Bees like them, but they're difficult to manage. Um, trying to get... You know, I, I live out in the country. Trying to persuade some local farm labourers to actually lift the hives up while I put a box in the bottom... Um, was quite exciting. They only did it for me once. Um, what I found with the um, uh, warrior hives, uh, and again, it wasn't an original idea, I picked it up in Australia, um, was the commercial beehives that use warrior hives actually put frames in. They don't just use top bars, they use small frames, which uh, again, I, I find useful. 
I've got two. They're not actually active at the moment, but um, yep, they were. They work. Would you want to know? Um, do you have a sense of the varroa levels in your hives? And is, do you find that there's any link to uh, viral levels, uh, for instance, deformed wing? Um, no, we don't monitor our varroa levels. Um, in the inspections that we do do, we would certainly look to see if there's any signs of deformed wing virus. And occasionally we get a bee inspector, although they seem to be quite a rare breed these days. Um, and the inspectors say that uh, our levels are minimal. So that seems fair enough. Um, where do you get your seeds for the pollination patches? Uh, this person's got half an acre that they want to turn into a wild meadow. Oh, originally we, uh, we went online. There are two um, uh, main tent. Emsgate was one that we've used uh, and they were very reliable. Um, they probably had the best uh, germination um, of anything we've had. Um, we've actually produced a little booklet, which again is on our website, about wildflower meadows and pollinator patches. There's a distinct difference between the two, by the way. A pollinator patch is a patch of annuals, whereas a wildflower meadow is a patch of grassland with wildflowers growing in it. And it's a completely different um, technique for managing it. And one of the problems with wildflower meadows is the farmers over the generations have been enriching the land and they've been using stronger types of grass. So where we came to our wildflower meadow, we basically took a bulldozer and scraped it down to the subsoil. Um, and we sowed the seed directly into the subsoil and that worked well for us. Yeah, there are problems with some of these mixtures though because they're, um, they're put up abroad and they, they, a lot of them aren't the uh, species that we've got in this country. So you've got to be careful that you get, get some that suit your locality and also soil type as well. Yes. Yeah, it's it's not an easy uh, thing. But again, uh, Mscape we've used and can recommend, and they do actually sell different mixtures for different uh, uh, soils um, and different parts of the country. Uh, I mean, it's, we all joke about the north-south divide, but in fact, um, uh, Climate-wise, it's quite noticeable. Before COVID, I used to travel backwards and forwards to London at least once a week. And looking out of the window, it's quite noticeable the difference in seasons between Lancaster and London, which is only 250 miles. So if you're on the south coast, you've got a different uh, microclimate to us uh, entirely. Fred, uh, not a beekeeping question, but... Um, when I saw your groups of volunteers helping on, on, the, on, the, on the ground, obviously some of them were organised, uh, but some of them look as if they're just local people coming in. How do you go about insurance for those? Um, it depends which group they were. Um, one of the groups you saw on the slides was Scouts, and they have it themselves. Um, our point is we are advising them. They are the group, so it's their responsibility, their insurance, and the parish council normally takes that on board. So we are merely providing them with technical advice rather than advising, um, rather than doing it. They're not our patches. We're advising them. Okay, so that is, a, is an issue that uh, any bee, beekeeping association may have if others come in and help for whatever reason. Um, well, I think you've got to be very careful what your remit is. Um, and explain to people up front. We actually run um, a seminar once a year, maybe twice a year during the winter, explaining how this works, how we can supply them with advice, we can give them guidance, but it is then the group who take on responsibility for the site and maintain it. Uh, we don't accept any responsibility for keeping it going. We just provide them with advice and they've got to sort the rest of it out. Parish councils normally have policies that cover this without any problem. Formal youth organisations do. The only problem you get is when you start using some um, certain types of power tools. Uh, I mean, you, we get community payback teams, but they won't let them loose with chainsaws or, uh, um, <coughs> or fire hoses or anything like that. Um, but it's, they do it. If you see what I mean? It's their responsibility. We make this very clear. 
we just provide advice and guidance. Um, I think uh, there'll be lots of uh, lots of listeners and viewers that when you talked about your swarm control method, their eyebrows raised. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the questions that that came in was, do you have do you have to fetch many colonies back from chimneys and 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 the local area? I know that you said you were fairly fairly rural. Have have any of these uh, swarms caught you out? I know everybody says bees love to nest in chimneys. In the 22 years I've been keeping bees, I've only ever once had to remove bees from a chimney. Um, yes, they do swarm into people's gardens, but we found that uh, there's such an interest in bees that people will ring us up and say, we've got a swarm of bees, can you come and collect it? You go there, the problem is keeping them back while you do it, because there's so much interest. We've not had any ill will at all. Very occasionally, and I had one uh, last spring, uh, a swarm went into a garden and there was a young woman there who was absolutely terrified. I mean, there's no other word for it. Um, almost to the point of being ill with worry. The bees had just a swarm, you know what a swarm's like. They were just sat there, they weren't buzzing around, they were just there. But she thought, you know, it could have been a whole pack of king cobras as far as she was concerned, and nothing was going to come into to the contrary. And in fact, in the end, her husband took her away while I removed the bees. In fact, I actually felt like saying, well, you know, we'll leave the bees and you go away. But there we are. <laughs> no, we, to be honest, we, we keep getting that view. And even in the, in the city, um, we've had no problems at all uh, with that one. In fact, I, I can tell you a story. It's a true story. Uh, but it's my son who keeps bees in southwest London on a flat roof. And uh, his bees swarmed while he was at work. He got a telephone call at work from a, an old lady who said, your swarm is in my garden. Right, he said, I'll come and collect it straight away. No, you won't, she said, you'll come at four o'clock. And when he went at four o'clock, she got all her friends in having tea and cakes and introduced him as the bee man who's going to remove the swarm while they all watched. And now they all have swarm boxes. So we, we haven't found that to be a problem. Excellent. Uh, and then I think the, the last question that's come in is, um, how many colonies did you start off with? And then six years on, how many have you got now? I started off with the traditional way, one nuke. And the following year, that nuke became a colony and swarmed. So that gave me two, and I bought another one in. That was three, and one arrived from somewhere else. That was four. Uh, the next year, those four developed into eight, plus two more that arrived. And my wife, who doesn't know anything about beekeeping, but is quite smart on mental arithmetic, saw the garden disappearing rather rapidly. Uh, I was also finding um, weekly inspections were getting too much. I mean, I run a business as well. Uh, I ended up with 30 sw uh, hives in the garden, and that was when I decided uh, enough was enough. Uh, at the moment, I have eight colonies in my garden. And that's... Uh, that's as many as I'm allowed to keep. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Fred, for a, a really interesting talk. Uh, back to you, Roger. Yeah, so, uh, thanks, Fred. I've got a couple of questions I've written down. That, uh, I hope you don't mind me asking oh. you. Uh, one is, it seems that if you've got a stable uh, membership uh, number, uh, that you've got something like a 20 to 25% churn rate in members, taking on 10 or 12 new ones each year, and you've got 50 which is fairly similar to um, other beekeeping associations I've found. Um, what is the reason for your people um, uh, uh, dropping out? Oh, um, what we find is we don't lose members uh, once they're members. What we do find is we get people coming on courses. They'll join the first year, but they will not actually then commit to bees. Uh, once oh, they've yeah. got bees, uh, yeah. they tend to stick with us. Same as everybody else, really. Then yes. And the other, and the other one is, um, I've been lucky enough to see your newsletter. Now, for only fifty members, I reckon you've got a brilliant newsletter. How do you find all the um, uh, all the copy to uh, to go in it? Because I'm sure there's an awful lot of newsletter editors uh, would would like to know the trick. No trick, you just we read widely and um, talk to other people. I mean, we exchange newsletters with a lot of um, 
uh, foreign, well, say a lot, nine foreign clubs um, who very kindly translate them into English for me. Um, we get that. I listen to um, the news. I, I look online as to what's going on. But because we have a, a broad interest in the environment generally, and some of our members are involved in all sorts of different aspects, we just get it fed in. But largely, it's a question of just monitoring what's going on. OK, well, thanks very much, Fred. Um, fascinating to find out how uh, other people um, uh, keep their bees. And as much as anything, how you set up this new group uh, from basically nothing in your area. So uh, thanks very much. And on behalf of the um, uh, members or the, the, um, the viewers, um, good luck. And good night, everybody. Good night, Fred. Thank you. Thank you very much.